Hey guys, the Comics Kid 2099 here, and I want to talk to you about a massive X-Men story that it took me a few weeks to read. On and off, I was reading X-Men Zero Tolerance, also known as Operation Zero Tolerance. Uh, this is the omnibus that collects, I think, 25 issues. I'm not going to tell you all the issues that are collected inside because that would take me a long time. It has issues from Generation X, X-Force, X-Men, and Cable, uh, I think one issue of X-Man, one issue of Uncanny X-Men, uh, and that's about it. It was mainly running through Generation X, X-Force, Cable, and X-Men. Uh, the other titles like uh, X-Man and Uncanny X-Men, uh, those were like barely touched by this event. It was mostly those other series that were going on. And I'm going to go ahead and set this down because it's really heavy, so it's going to make a noise. There we go. Okay. Uh, Basically, this story, if you've never heard of it, or if you've heard of it, but you don't know what it's about, which is kind of the boat I was in. I bought this because it was an X-Men story, and I figured, well, this is pretty decently cheap uh, for the amount of comics I'm getting, so I'm going to go ahead and buy it. And then I didn't really know what I was getting into when I read it, uh, but the story is basically that the government has put all their, uh, they are backing this guy named Bastion, and Bastion is this human-looking sentinel, and I'm gonna go ahead and tell you right now, we don't actually find that out in this book. All we know about Bastion in this book is that, uh, he does not have a past. Nobody knows anything about him, and it's implied that he's not entirely human, but they don't actually come right out and say exactly who and what he is. I think later on after this event, they revealed that he was kind of a combination of the Master Mold and Nimrod, but they don't actually reveal any of that here. All they say is that he doesn't have a past, and in one of the last issues of this book, they show that he has robot eyes, but they don't actually reveal any information about him. So anyway, this guy, Bastion, uh, he genuinely believes that mutants are a threat to humanity. And so he has put together this proposal for the United States government to say, if you guys will let me, I will hunt down all of these mutants and it will be legal. And in a lot of ways, it kind of feels like what could potentially lead into the future that you see in the Days of Future Past storyline. And so in this story, more than ever before, mutants are public enemy number one. They are hunted down by the government, and they are captured, experimented on. Some mutants, I guess, were potentially killed. We don't ever actually see any of them die on story, but some of them could have been killed, probably. Uh, Bastion has all of these human beings who he has turned into undercover sleeper agent sentinels and so a human being could just be walking down the street and then the sentinel programming inside this human would sense that there's a mutant nearby and then it would transform into kind of this human sized sentinel and would capture or kill the mutant and so uh, this story that and that's basically the premise of the story and I really liked this story. Uh, I did not expect to like it going in. In fact, I didn't know a whole lot about it going in. All I knew was that Bastion was the bad guy, but I didn't know anything about the story. I didn't know that the X-Men are on the run and they are kind of uh, having to be more resourceful than they usually are. And in the back of the book, there was a short interview done with Scott Lobdell, who is the main mastermind behind this whole event. And he was talking about how in the last several years before this story, he felt like the X-Men had kind of gotten away from being mutants and specifically using their mutant powers to solve problems. And he was talking about how, basically, he didn't say it exactly like this, but he was saying that things had gotten a little too cushy for the X-Men. And they had this nice danger room. They lived in a mansion. They had Cerebro that would help them find mutants. And he was saying that things weren't hard for the X-Men anymore. And so he wanted to use this event to kind of make things a little bit more challenging for the X-Men again. And he totally does that. Even after this event, and I'm going to slightly spoil the events of the story, but at the end, Bastion is captured by the U.S. government, and the U.S. government basically changes its mind and says, we're no longer backing Operation Zero Tolerance, so you can't hunt mutants anymore. And uh, at the end of that, the X-Men, they come back home, and everything that they owned is gone. Everything. Like, even the carpet has been picked up and taken by the people who worked for Operation Zero Tolerance. So they don't have the danger room anymore. They don't have Cerebro. They don't have any of the luxuries in life that they had that would help them do their thing. And so even after this event where they're no longer being hunted down by the government, things are no longer as easy for them as they once were. And I think that's a very good thing that happened because of this event. And personally, I feel like some of the worst moments in the X-Men's history are when 
things are a little too cushy for them. I don't necessarily want to see things go completely to Hades in a handbasket for the X-Men. I kind of like there to be a middle ground between living a cushy life at the mansion with all of these nice amenities and being on the run like they are in this story. I'd like there to be sort of a middle ground, uh, and that's kind of a pointed jab at the direction the X-Men comics have taken since Avengers vs. X-Men, but that is neither here nor there. Uh, this event, like I said, is composed of stories going on in different series, and this, the whole thing is maybe my second favorite X-Men event that I've ever read. My favorite X-Men event is the Mutant Massacre, and I love that event because A, it fundamentally changed the direction that the X-Men comics were going in, and B, for the most part, if you weren't reading The New Mutants or X-Factor, if you were only reading Uncanny X-Men, you could still understand what was going on in Uncanny X-Men. For the most part, there was a little bit of crossover where something would happen in an issue of Thor, and then you don't know what that is unless you're reading Thor. But for the most part, you could read each series involved with the Mutant Massacre, and only read one series, and you could understand what was going on in that series. And I really feel like that is a, a that would be a very hard thing to pull off if you're writing this stuff, and B, when it is accomplished, it makes for a really excellent event because you can read it all as a whole and it works as a whole or you can read each individual series and each one works as an individual series. And I think Operation Zero Tolerance sort of does that. Uh, there's a little bit of crossing over uh, about like the Mutant Massacre. Uh, maybe a little bit more crossing over here than there is in the Mutant Massacre because you've got Jubilee who is being held prisoner by the Operation Zero Tolerance people and we keep seeing her being held prisoner in Generation X and then uh, someone helps her escape in Generation X. Well then suddenly we see her show up in the Wolverine solo series. I forgot the Wolverine solo series is included in this as well. Uh, she shows up there and so if you were only reading Wolverine and suddenly Jubilee is walking in the desert and bumps into a cactus, you might be like, what's going on here? And of course you would know that there's this Operation Zero Tolerance storyline going on, but you might not necessarily understand why is Wolf uh, Jubilee right here in the middle of the desert unless you were also reading Generation X. But it's not nearly as uh, tied in with itself as any other X-Men event. If you read like Messiah Complex, there are four series that are all involved with Messiah Complex, and it's like, first you need to read this issue of X-Men, then this issue of Uncanny X-Men, then this issue of X-Factor, and if you're only reading X-Factor, you will absolutely be lost and confused because it's a 13-part story of which X-Factor is providing two of the parts. So you would be reading like part 10 and part 5 in X-Factor, and then you would be fundamentally confused reading that story or part of that story. That's not what's going on here. There is, like I said, there is a little bit of crossing over, but it's not to the detriment of the story, and it's also not to the detriment of each of the individual series. Uh, like X-Force and Cable kind of cross over a little bit. Uh, the issue of X-Man that's collected in here crosses over a little bit with Cable. And then um, the X-Men as a team, they are actually showing up in the Wolverine solo series. So if you're wanting Wolverine as a solo, uh, that's not really going on here because the X-Men, Cyclops, Storm, Jean Grey, and Wolverine, they're all showing up in the Wolverine solo title. And then in the X-Men book, the book where you would expect to see those guys, you've got Iceman uh, and a whole bunch of other people who aren't really X-Men, and then they kind of become X-Men after this, uh, specifically Mero and uh, Dr. Cecilia Reyes. And I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, this event is probably pretty well known for introducing those guys into the X-Men world, as well as Maggot. And Maggot actually is not really part of this storyline, because he was introduced in Uncanny X-Men, which, like I said, there's only one issue of Uncanny X-Men in this whole 25-issue tome, and Maggot is kind of in a separate storyline that doesn't really have anything to do with Operation Zero Tolerance. He shows up in the very last issue of this book when all of the X-Men teams are coming home, but he himself was not involved with the Zero Tolerance stuff. Uh, but Marrow is brought into the team, and she was a mutant terrorist. She was a Morlock when she was a child, and then she grew up in this alternate reality that is featured in the miniseries Storm, which I have read and reviewed a while back. Uh, she grew up in this alternate reality called The Hill, and then she came back to planet Earth and is basically a cruel, mean, twisted mutant terrorist. Uh, she believes that humans are the scum of the Earth, and she will do anything in her power to make sure that mutants are not persecuted. So in a way, She's very similar to Magneto, except that I feel like Magneto is not needlessly cruel. He would not torture a human being, but I feel like Mero would. Mero, if she was alone in a room with a human being, 
even a human being who didn't do anything to a mutant, she would probably torture that human just because she's a mutant and she feels like that's her right. Uh, in this story, uh, I, I think I remember reading somewhere that the editorial were basically forcing Scott Lobdell to make Marrow an X-Man. And of course, he had created the character of Marrow in Generation X. That was where she first showed up. And then she kind of was brought into the main X-Men book where she was kind of a rival for Storm. And they mention a lot of that here where Storm ripped out Marrow's heart and then it's revealed that she actually had two hearts so she didn't die. Uh, kind of weird stuff. Uh, but... I feel like Scott Lobdell, I, I think I read somewhere that he was forced to make her a new X-Man. And so I feel like he's working with what he's got, but it still feels very unorganic. It does not feel like Marrow would really join the X-Men. Uh, even in a situation where all mutants are being hunted down, best case scenario, she would help Iceman in this situation, and then once all of the Sentinels are called off, she would go back home, and she would say, you know what, I don't like any of you X-Men, I'm not gonna live here at the mansion. But then at the end of the story, she does live at the mansion, and they're trying to play her off as a gruff loner with a heart of gold and that's extremely inconsistent with the version of this character that showed up before and like I say I don't necessarily think that we can lay that at Scott Lobdell's feet I think that was something that he was forced to do and so he did the best with what he had uh, and then you have Cecilia Reyes and who is a character that a lot of people really like this character I am not one of them I have never liked this character I think that she's okay in this event but then after this event, I feel like there's no reason for her to stick around. Uh, she is a mutant who spent most of her life basically wishing that she wasn't a mutant. And she kind of whines about, I didn't ask for this, I just want to be a doctor, I just want to have a normal life. And then the Sentinels are coming after her and Iceman saves her life. And then she's yelling at him, trying to blame him because the Sentinels are coming after her. And I can understand where she's coming from. If I lived in the Marvel Universe, I certainly wouldn't want to be a mutant. Nobody would want to be a mutant because life really sucks if you're a mutant. I can understand that. The problem is, I don't want to hear her constantly whining. She reminds me a lot of Dazzler, who is very similar. Dazzler was a character who's like, I don't want to be a superhero. I don't want superpowers. I just want to be a rock star. Why can't you people just let me be a rock star? And it's really infuriating when you have any superhero, not just Dazzler or Cecilia Reyes, but any superhero who just continually, perpetually whines about being a superhero. There was a brief period of time in Buffy the Vampire Slayer where Buffy was constantly whining about how hard it is to be a vampire slayer. And Spider-Man, there have been significant periods in his life, I'm thinking specifically in the 60s, where he would kind of whine about how hard his job is of being Spider-Man. And always, my answer is always the same. If you don't like it, get out. Stop doing it. Uh, I know that that would make for a very boring story if you have Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Buffy says, I don't like being a Vampire Slayer, and then she makes the sensible choice of just quitting. That would make for a very boring story because then you're taking away all of the story, and also you're making your character very selfish. Uh, but I would rather a character be selfish and get out of the X-Men books than continually, perpetually whine about how unfair life is. This character of Cecilia Reyes, she's very realistic, but I don't like her, and I don't want to read about her, and she was definitely one of my least favorite parts of this whole thing, and I know a lot of people really like this character. I've never, ever heard anyone actually explain to me why they like this character. I only ever hear people say, man, I wish that Cecilia Reyes was still in the X-Men books, I don't know why, because uh, she's not really a very likable character here. She's very rude, she's very selfish, and she likes to throw the blame on people who the blame obviously doesn't go on. Uh, basically just an all-around unlikable character. Uh, so this whole event kind of is trying to do a new version of the all-new, all-different X-Men, which in Giant Size X-Men issue 1 in 1975, we find out that uh, four of the original five X-Men have been kidnapped, actually uh, six people have been kidnapped. Uh, Polaris and Havoc were in that group too. Uh, six people were kidnapped, Cyclops escapes, and then he and Professor X form a new team of X-Men to go and rescue the old team. And so it's like, we have this established team, and now we're throwing in some new members into this team during a story of peril. And that's kind of what's going on here with the all-new team being Marrow, Maggot, and Cecilia Reyes, even though Maggot was introduced separately. Uh, so it's like, we've got a brand new generation of X-Men joining this group. Uh, the difference is, we still have a whole bunch of X-Men who were X-Men before this, who are sticking around, unlike Giant Size X-Men Issue 1, which ends with most of the original X-Men leaving the team and Cyclops sticking around, this has, like, basically all of the X-Men sticking around and then adding three new characters. And 
The problem is, none of these characters really work. Like I said, I don't really like Cecilia Reyes. Uh, Mero, I like her fine as an anti-hero terrorist kind of character. I like her much more as an enemy of the X-Men, but I don't really think that she works well as an ally to the X-Men, or even one of the X-Men. And then Maggot, we get so very little of him here that I really can't form an opinion other than say that his mutant power is ridiculous. Uh, that's going on here. I don't really have a whole lot to say here other than I liked this story a lot more than I thought I would. And the reason I didn't think I would think much of it is because in general, I don't really like the 1990s for the X-Men. Uh, that was a pretty rough decade for the X-Men, especially the early part of the 90s, when uh, people like Jim Lee and Fabian Nassizia were taking over the reins of the X-Men books from Chris Claremont, who was essentially piloting the entire ship, and then he leaves because he wasn't liking the way he was being treated, and then suddenly you've got like four or five X-Men books being handled by different people, it kind of got really messy really quick, and a lot of the stuff that was going on in the early days wasn't very good. Uh, but then, I really love the Age of Apocalypse, and I really love Operation Zero Tolerance. And so, maybe I've been giving the X-Men of the 90s kind of... Uh, I've been a little too harsh on that decade. Uh, now, some of it really is terrible, but... I'm finding more and more that there's some of it that's really good. Uh, this is my second favorite X-Men event that I've ever read. So that's saying quite a bit. Uh, I think maybe part of that was that my expectations were so incredibly low. But even if I had had more neutral expectations, I really think that I would have come away from this liking it as much as I did now. Uh, I think that's about all I have to say. Uh, of course, this is 25 issues that are collected here, and there's even more stuff that is going on before and after this. Like, Bastion as a character was actually being set up for a little while before the comics that are collected here. And then there's Aftermath and stuff that isn't really collected here. Uh, but there is a lot of stuff going on with the Operation Zero Tolerance. So if you happen to buy this omnibus and you really love it, then you're probably going to want to go and pick up some uh, single issues, go back issue hunting, and look for some of the stuff that came out before this because there's a lot of other Zero Tolerance uh, prelude going on in titles like Generation X, where Jubilee is kidnapped, uh, stuff going on there that isn't collected here. Uh, but I really like this story. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I hope that you guys liked this video, and I hope that I was able to convince you to go and read this story. Uh, even if you don't necessarily want to fork out like 60, 70 bucks for this omnibus, I think there was a shorter trade paperback that doesn't collect 25 issues. It collects a shorter number of issues. So maybe if you don't want to buy this really heavy duty book, maybe you want to seek out the smaller book that was put out in the 90s. Uh, that's something that you might want to do. I hope that you guys like this video. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I will be back later in the week with a different kind of video. See you then.